Hollow Ballers. We're here once again to uncover the truth of the myths and the mysteries of the past. And where better to go on this journey than into the Burning Crusade, the first expansion ever made by Blizzard for World of Warcraft. Today I'm going to take you to March 29th, 2007. On that day, the Guild Nihilum defeated Lady Vash world first, bringing them one step closer to facing Illidan Stormrage. However, there's no fanfare. There's no glory. There's no video to this day. Interestingly enough, a month later, on May 5th, 2007, an as yet unknown guild named Method defeated Lady Vash world second. And they immediately released the video. In that video, we hear cries of world first legit. Interestingly, a few weeks later, an article by one of the members of Nihilum is released, bringing the whole situation into a brand new light that has not been solved to this day. So once again, my friends, won't you join me as we ask the only question that matters? What really happened? The Burning Crusade was an audacious project from Blizzard and a learning experience for them going forward. Bold decisions, some good and some bad. Check out our legacy of the Burning Crusade for details. Important to us today though is that they knew their crown jewel was PvE raiding. They did it better than anyone else. As such, they went the extra mile. Two tiers, two world bosses, five raid zones, 29 raid bosses, were all in the game at launch. Blizzard wildly underestimated how much their players would gobble up their new content and fully intended to have their next raids, the Black Temple and Mount Hyjal, available long before players were done with their release content. Heroic dungeons themselves would take the average player many weeks to complete before they could even consider entering the haunting and beloved halls of Karazhan. In our previous video, we saw the rise of Nihilum at the end of Vanilla, and in TBC, they went for the throat. They claimed world firsts all over the game. Gruul, Nihilum. Magtheranen's Lair, Nihilum. Voidreaver, Alar, Hydros the Unstable, Lord Kazak, even showing their absolute dominance by releasing a video showing that they were doing Gruul 15-man instead of 25. All this while the forums were ablaze with people complaining that Gruul was far too hard. They seemed unstoppable. Only the US team Death and Taxes, looking to claim back their glory after Kalthazad, were putting up a fight. They crushed most of Serpent Shrine Cavern. A fun fact, the lurker below was a secret boss of the cavern. With no dungeon journal or PTR testing, no one even knew it existed. Nihilum fished up the beast and claimed world first, only for then, death and taxes to reveal they had been farming the lurker for weeks and kept it completely secret from the world in order to have an advantage. You see, the lurker had some of the best gear in the game, especially the Mallet of the Tides tanking weapon. We all knew the item existed, it had been found in databases, it was clearly from Serpent Shrine Cavern by design, but no one could find it. A great reason to keep awareness of this boss a complete secret. The main goal, of course, is to kill Kel'thas and Lady Bash. Killing these two grants you access to the Black Temple of Mount Hyjal, the next high tier of raiding. Here's your problem, though. Tempest Keep is a complete clown show, a fiesta. Not only is Alar just undoable, but High Astromancer Solarian was so broken, so buggy, so busted, that guilds hadn't even bothered to pull her. It was common knowledge, at least even for us, that you just didn't bother with that boss. One night in late April, the guild Deathwish, let's go and see if they've done anything. And they had. When? No idea. Blizzard had secretly hotfixed and changed the boss into one of the easier bosses of the raid. And of course, as soon as news spread, because they were like, dudes, we got a world first, we got a world first, everybody went and flooded and killed Solarium. But what about Kalthas? Kalthas is a living nightmare. 
Very few people ever saw the original version, and certainly the four or five versions of Kalthas that existed until we finally got one that was doable. We're talking about invisible void traps, like the ones you'll seen on the Four Horsemen that appear under your feet and kill you in two ticks, but they're completely invisible. People just dying all over the place. The Phase 1 adds having the ability to teleport to the mages and just kill them, forcing them to farm crazy consumables to maybe survive, which still didn't help, meaning all the combat resident things were used in Phase 1. And then we get to Kale himself. In that fight, they gave you legendary items with special unuse effects. One of them is the shield. This gives you a bubble in order to protect yourself against Kael'thas's mighty attack, and the tanks have to use the item. Only, they made it so the shield wouldn't come off cooldown while he was doing those attacks. So you couldn't survive and had to cycle through tanks. There's actually more things. I've got a link below to Eoy's article, a member of Insidia who wrote about all these things if you want more details on what the original version was like, because no doubt you never saw that in Classic. Needless to say, though, my friends, Tempest Keep ain't worth the time. After talking with many players in the World First team at this time, one thing they all believe is that the last bosses were intentionally broken in order to hamstring players from finishing everything so they could work on that next raid tier. Of course, with my extensive experience with these things over the years, it's far more likely that the bosses were simply untested and sloppy compared to the earlier tier 4 raids that most people would see. With Vash at least looking progressible, with hotfixes coming in here and there, they got to work. I've spoken to several members of Nihilum, and it's universally agreed, their kill was full clown car. Here's what we know, and it's in the public domain. After one of their phase 2 wipes while the players lay dead on the floor, for some reason her HP was linked to her chain conduits surrounding her that would deactivate one by one. Every time they did, her HP would drop ultimately to one HP on the last conduit, and then she would reset. It's at this point, a shadow priest named Loot popped his stole stone, used shadow word death, and killed Lady Vash. This obviously caused some glitch as Vash was in the process of resetting, so immediately upon her death, a fresh, brand new Vash spawned, while her corpse lay lying on the floor. This isn't in dispute, however. I'm sorry, Emperor. This article that you can clearly see that appeared on Nihilum's website, didn't share in the victory of what they had done, bringing them one step closer to reaching the upper echelon. One boss remaining. In fact, it's a denouncement of Blizzard's broken buggy bosses. However, what's not mentioned is important too. At no point during this time, at no point, is there any mention as to the nature of how they got the kill. Now, of course, Nihilum are not the only people who have access to Vash. A lot of guilds have tried it, and what appears to them is an impossible wall. Extremely good guilds have been trying it, and they're asking questions. How? How did you do this? This seems sus. We've tried it. We're not exactly that much worse than you guys. So how the hell did you get this done? Well, a couple of weeks later, some info starts to leak. They can't keep it secret forever. And the nature of how they got that kill starts to be revealed. But it doesn't end there. Soon there's about to be something else casting it in another light. And before we get to that, I want to tell you about our really cool Dragonflight themed rock shirts. That's right, we have come up with some quality rock band shirts to represent your Dragonflight. The Earth Warder, the Life Binder, the Timeless, the Dreamer, the Spellweaver. We've got them available as t-shirts and hoodies, so why don't you head on over to PreachGaming.com. They've got front and back designs, they look so sick out in the real world, and no one's even going to call you a nerd for wearing one. Method believed they could do it. If the stars align and they play perfectly, Vash was doable. And so they went for it. I spoke to Sko, leader of Method, about this. In the discussion, he says that once they knew the strats, the only viable way of overcoming her was to gather every single world buff possible. Then, they would have every consumable possible. Then, they would have 25 warlocks outside the raid zone to ensure that every player in the raid had their own personal soulstone. 
All combined, they literally had one real try per week on Vash. If they didn't kill it then, tough luck, go again next time. A full month later than Nihilum, Method did the impossible. They did this. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Go do it! Go subdue! Do some shit, man! Yes! Come on, you went poison. You went poison. We can't get to it. Okay. Yes! yes! <laughs> World first, first yes. motherfucker! Yes. World's first proper kill. Amazingly, even with a legit kill, the boss was still broken. Famously, the spore bats raining down acid onto the raid didn't despawn and made looting the boss impossible. Here you can see Method desperately trying to claim their loot, but of course the bats had infinite range and murdered them on the elevator. In Skull's words, they weren't even that bothered. More content at having risen to a world first level and completing such an amazing achievement. They followed this moment by ticketing a game master about getting the loot. Just to be asked, how often do you run into this issue with Lady Vash? Remember this is the world's second kill. 2007 was a wild time. In the video we hear that cry of legit world first after Nihilum's shenanigans have become known. But then the question was, who really got the world first? Was the scuffed kill of Nihilum intentional? And so they just knew a bug, killed the bugged boss and moved on, claiming that first? Or was it a YOLO play? And they just took what had happened as a win and had no reason to waste more time on such a broken encounter. And it's important to know, that shortly after during Wrath of the Lich King, when we actually had proper raid races, Baby Kungan and Baby Sko got to stand side by side. And while they were there, they did discuss Lady Vash, only to have tongue-in-cheek responses as to the true nature of what happened. Yeah, I think, I mean, I met Kungan a few times, like, um, like a long time ago, like back, th back then. And I think he did admit to me in person that, you know, it was it was done in the way that was kind of rumored. Yeah, I mean, I think because I wasn't obviously in that raid, in that raid, I wasn't in part of the Hillam, obviously. It's, yeah. It is definitely a little bit of a gray area as to whether they just did YOLO, I'm going to, I see the boss resign to 1 HP. And then, you know, they just soul stone Shadow of Death, like, you know, as almost like a, a trial thing, like, mm -hmm. and then boss just died. Or if they noticed, obviously, after a certain, you know, after each wipe, the boss did drop one HP and they did shower with death. I think, to be fair, if I have to be honest, I'm probably following on the second side of that. But, you know, they obviously realize when they wipe from the boss, that's, you know, it does drop down to one HP. It's important to understand how Nihilum's internal structure works, because it's not like your guild or anyone else's. So let me do a little chart as to understand how this where Chris okay so like your guild you all get on voice comms you club together and you probably have a really great time Nihilum even since the vanilla days didn't work that way first things first voice comms was not a requirement of Nihilum even getting world first that might sound completely absurd to you but it actually makes a lot of sense remember Nihilum comes from the days of a roster of probably 50 or even well at least 40 plus people right there are some people there you simply don't want to hang out with uh, then they talk all the time. We've all encountered them at some point, is that they kind of make your night more annoying and you kind of wish they STF up uh, on occasion. There are also people who simply can't play very well while people are talking, and there are people who can't play very well if they can't talk. Having to sit in silence all night is not their idea of fun, and everybody wants to have fun. In Kungan's mind, and in many others, the idea was that if you don't have voice comms, or you do, but you play in the environment you want to play in, you will focus better, you will play better. And clearly, it worked for them. That does not mean, though, that the guys didn't have voice comms. This is a common misunderstanding. It just wasn't required. Voice comms absolutely existed, and many of them used it, but what happened is, what you can probably imagine and you've encountered in discords across the world, is clicks started to form with the people who wanted to hang out with each other. Divided by nationality, depending on how good you are. And down at the bottom, you had your classics, right? So there's people down here like the Greeks, so that's your Roger Browns of the world, terrible. 
uh, and you had maybe the Swedes, they would be down here, uh, even though Kung is Swedish, but he's the exception. Uh, we'll let that slide. And then, of course, you had maybe the French uh, before they invaded Final Fantasy XIV. So they're down the bottom, and they stick together, and they do most of their own thing, and they talk in comms in their own language, very similar to what guilds like Paragon would do in the future with their all Finnish thing. In the next up tier, you had the Brits. You had the Brits. These were considered kind of the casuals. And then you can throw a whole bunch of others into the other category, but they were still below the Danish Mafia. I'm not joking here, when, and that's not a name I've come up with. That's what they were known as. The Danish Mafia was a very real thing, and they were extraordinarily powerful. And they weren't enclosed. It wasn't, say, Danish only. It's just the fact that the Danes in Nihilum were extremely good. Many of them had a very extensive Counter-Strike background. They were considered to be way better than everyone else in the guild, and they also dripped of elitism. After speaking to the leader, which I did recently, of the Danish Mafia, is 100% true. So much, in fact, that his memory of what happened to the little people is practically non-existent. And he really doesn't remember much of anything because it never affected them. They had so much sway and so much power in the guild. Now, it wasn't tied off to just the Danes. If you were a brilliant Swedish player, which they were, you were allowed in. But you had to be really funny, extremely good at the game, dripping with elitism in order to be a part of the Danish Mafia. And the problem was the Danish Mafia didn't look too kindly on everybody else, especially the casual, and obviously, therefore, less good, British players. So why does this all matter? Some time after Method's kill in May 2007, Lutz had left Nihilum and quit WoW altogether. But he did not go quietly. He publicly denounced Nihilum on the WoW forums, claiming that they had been abusing bugs in the game since Blackwing Lair claiming that the guild members such as Awake were paying for Kungan's IRL bills. The most damning claim, however, was that their bugged kill of Lady Vash those few months earlier had been completely intentional. This claim ignited the forums. They had just seen Method claim World Second over a month later, slamming their heads into the wall over and over again until they had finally risen and climbed that mountain. Kungan, however came with receipts. At this time, he posted actual screenshots of the kill, which included the chat logs. You could see visible confusion amongst the members of the guild asking what happened, while Vash lies dead on the floor. You can also see Luke claiming responsibility. She was at 1%. I couldn't resist. But the damage had already been done. When I spoke to Sko about the screenshot, he made a good point. It isn't hard to get people to act a certain way if you intend on using it later as proof. So what is the truth of the matter? What really happened that night? Was it intentional? Was it not? Well, I've spoken to a lot of people. Lots and lots of hours have gone into figuring out the minutiae of what happened that fateful night. And honestly, speaking to a lot of members of the Nihilum team that was there and actually played it, it was unintended. And it was simply one of their players, Loot, who saw an opportunity. The boss's health was dropping, sat at 1% HP, they had a soul stone, they used it and killed the boss. And the chat logs show, just couldn't help himself. Then why might you ask, why would someone have an outburst like this, accuse the guild of doing all these things, be angry at the leadership? Well, probably due to the internal power struggle of Nihilum at the time. And I want to be clear on this, we have tried desperately for several weeks to reach out to Loot himself and add some perspective. And we've been able to do that. We've dealt with doppelgangers, people with the same name, all kind of things like that. And if you see this, we would love to hear from you. Absolutely love to hear from you and get some perspective. Because of course, what I'm about to say is what I can find given everything I know. What seems to have happened is that Nihilum brought with them a lot of players. They scored the world first Kalthazad and a lot of those players did not want to quit what was now a famous world first guild that had people traveling to their servers daily just to talk to them and whisper them. A huge amount of fame unseen in this game before. And of course, let's carry that into the next expansion. But as the raid size reduces to 25, and you can see this clearly evidenced in their videos at the time. Look at the TBC videos and look at the raid frames. There are a few core members there, but look at how many names change on a boss by boss basis. They had a ton of players. And then you include the clicks. 
including the Danish Mafia and others, who were looking down at those players that they felt they were carrying. As somebody who was there during that transition from Vanilla to the Burning Crusade, where you could trim the fat, as it were, on your big 40-man roster, there was a lot of this. You don't belong here anymore. We're clearly better than you. And you actually are a problem. We don't want to bring you to the raid. It was sad, but it is the truth of what happened to a lot of guilds at that time. And players like Loot, who have been around since Vanilla, probably understood that they were being pushed out, despite the fact that they'd been around since long before the guild had found its fame. Starm of Nihilum completely told me that by Black Temple, they had a very small roster. And that raid team was pretty much set in stone at that point. So it's understandable why someone might feel frustrated, angry, and may feel the need to lash out at the guild they had helped build. For me, what is etched in the history books would remain the same regardless. Nihilum's dominance over the PvE world is unmatched. Smashing your face into a boss that you simply don't need to while other ones still stand makes no sense. But that doesn't diminish what Method accomplished either. They proved themselves fully capable of attaining that world first rank, and they're going to chase that for quite some time. I want to give a special shout out here to Skull from Method, to Starim and Close of Nihilum, as well as several other members who remain anonymous, for giving us an insight into what happened on those fateful nights. When we come back, we're going to be looking at a franchise that's been around for 30 years and deciding once and for all, which of its entries did it best. But following that, we're coming back to the Burning Crusade. We're going to deep dive into what happened behind the scenes in an event that brought two great guild houses to their knees and birthed a brand new champion. Was it all smooth sailing? Of course not. We'll see you again.